singing we're having, what wonderful fellowship we're having. It's always such a great joy to see this many brethren come together, and especially after the past two years and what we've been through, and uh, to come together, to join our voices together in song, to pray together, to study the Word of God together, to be able to hug each other. And uh, I really and truly think we are going to have to make a decision, and that is that we're going to go forward with the work of the Lord, regardless of what disease is out there. And it's time that happened. It's time we changed in that regard. Is it wrong to be anxious about a sermon on anxiety? Well, <laughs> I have been now for almost two years and uh, because I was getting ready for this last year and then it didn't happen and now uh, when you kind of mull these things over and stew them around in your mind, it gets a little hard after a while. Uh, my mama used to say, I'm more nervous than a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs and that's kind of where I am uh, this morning. And uh, I was even more nervous. I, I forgot Russ was going to introduce me. I, I should have walked out the door. But, uh, you know, he was kind. And uh, that is rare for Russ, if you know him very well. But we appreciate him so much. And I do want to express my appreciation and appreciation on the part of those of us who are on the committee for affirming the faith for the North MacArthur congregation, for the hard work all of these people do to get ready for this and to help us with this and to man the doors and to take care of the nursery and all of the things they do to make this such a comfortable uh, situation. You know, all of us deal with very difficult circumstances from time to time in our lives. Sometimes they seemingly get to be almost unbearable but we have a promise from the Lord, and it comes from Paul. And if ever there was anyone who was tempted seemingly beyond what he was able to bear, it would have been Paul. Being in prison, being beaten, being shipwrecked, all of those things that he went through that he talks about in 2 Corinthians. But in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, he teaches us that the Lord has promised us that there is no temptation on this earth that man has not experienced and has not overtaken some men. But God is faithful who will not let you be tempted beyond what you are able to bear, but with every temptation provides the way of escape. And so when we become so caught up and wrapped in anxiety, we need to remember that the Lord has promised us that He's going to get us through. And uh, what Brother Watkins was preaching just a few minutes ago uh, is so true. We don't know exactly how God's going to work that out, but we know that He will, Romans 8 and verse 28 says. And that may not even happen in our lifetimes. But that will help us to quell the anxiety within our hearts and mind. God knows our hearts and Jesus understands our life. Now that doesn't mean God doesn't understand our life. He made us. He's the manufacturer. But Jesus came down to try out the car. And He lived with us and for us and endured everything that we endure and was tempted in every way like as we, yet without sin, the Bible teaches us. And so this morning we, we turn our attention to one of the greatest passages on anxiety and that's found in Philippians 4. You know, when we talk about Philippians, we think perfect church. Nothing wrong in Philippi. Uh, great people and, and just have such wonderful faith. Paul loved them so much. There is absolutely no doubt of that. But that book is written for a problem. There were two ladies that were going to tear that congregation apart. And so he is building up to that as he comes to chapter 4. And he wants Yodi and Syntyche to work this thing out and tells the brothers, you help them work this out. But then he gives us so many wonderful things here. Do you have to be reminded to be joyful? You actually do. Anxiety will make you sad. Anxiety will make you angry. Anxiety will keep you so tied up on the inside in your heart that you can't function. 
Your relationships suffer. So many other things suffer when that happens. So where does Paul start here in verse 4? He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious for anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving in your hearts, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The word anxiety or anxious that is used here is marinao, and it means a distracting care. Now, is it always wrong to be anxious? No. As, uh, as I was training to preach, I went to one of my friends who had been preaching for about 40 years at that time, and I said, how do you stay so calm in the pulpit? He said, I'm lying. And uh, he didn't mean that. He didn't mean he's lying. He said, I am so tied up on the inside. And he said, I think it takes nervousness to do a good job. And so there's nothing wrong with some anxiety. Every football player that ever walked out on a football field is anxious about his part on the team. Every Bible class teacher that walks into that Bible class wants to make sure that their children get the very best. And so they're anxious when they get there. And we are anxious about many things when it's not wrong for for us to be anxious. But if it becomes distracting, if it takes our eyes off the cross and we're turning to the side and looking at everything else, we're going to fail. Our daughter was a great runner. She ran both cross country and track, placed in the top 10 in the state every year while she was doing that. And one of the first things we taught her, she was only a fifth grader when she ran in the Hershey uh, track meet, and that was for little kids. And uh, I told her, I said, when you're getting close to the finish line, don't ever look back. The body is designed in such a way that if you're distracted that way and you're trying to go forward at full speed and you do this, it locks your body up and you're, you're going to slow down. And if that person's right beside you, they're going to go right past you when you do. We must calm down the distractions and avoid the distractions. Hebrews 5 and verse 7, in the days of flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Our Lord was troubled from time to time. He had anxiety that was not sinful. So we're all going to suffer like he did. In Proverbs 12 and verse 25, anxiety in a man's uh, heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. That comes from the Hebrew word diaga, and it means care, fear, heaviness, and sorrow. And so that's the wrong kind of anxiety. It weighs us down. We're not going to be able to finish the race that the Lord has called us to. I think Tim remembered whenever he came up with some of the topics and asked me to speak on this that I had often spoken about my father. My dad was a very shy man, a very quiet man to, to a great extent, but he suffered terribly from anxiety. He had his first, what they called back then, nervous breakdown in 1956. A lot of people smile when I say that, and they said, no wonder you were born that year. And uh, so, you know, it was hard on him. And it's kind of funny, my sister was born four years later and he had another one. But then that just kind of followed a pattern. And in 1970, when he had his last one, his old doctor had died. It was one of the greatest blessings on this earth because they sent him to a new doctor. And this new doctor said, Jim, I'm not going to be satisfied with the findings of your old doctor because I knew the type of work that he did and he never looked very deep and so he tested my father from stem to stern and when he got done he found out my dad didn't have good flow uh, from his heart to his to his brain and he caused a chemical imbalance daddy lived on a very tiny pill for the rest of his life never had any of those problems again 
But it was embarrassing to him when he had those four or five breakdowns and my mom would hide him away from us and then carry him to the hospital over in Waco. And we as little kids were wondering, what's going on? What's happening? I think our older sister knew, but she didn't tell us. And then when we got older, we figured out what that was all about, and, and we didn't know if it was our fault, you know. You've got four kids, maybe you're anxious because of that. But it wasn't. But he learned to handle anxiety. And a lot of that also later on had to do with the building of his faith. He became a much stronger Christian. He desired the Word of God and to study it. And he and my mom, when they retired, sat out on their back porch and read and studied and took notes on their Bibles two hours every morning. And it helped him so much. Anxiety can destroy you, but you can handle it. And surviving the tough thing of anxiety is what we're here to talk about this morning. Professional help is sometimes needed, and, uh, and th- we have great Christian counselors in this city, and so if you need to go to one, that's a great thing to do. But that should never be the first place where we start. In Matthew 6, we are to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto us. And isn't it interesting what the very next verse says? And it says, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. It has its own trouble. And so you and I don't need to be buying trouble we don't have yet. We need to take each day at a time. And this morning, I want us to look at four things. One, I want us to, first of all, think about how bad this problem is. And just a few things there. The second thing, what are some of the causes? But then we're going to turn to the good news. You're not alone in this. God has shown us examples of people who had anxiety. Not all of this was sinful, but dealt with their troubles and how God helped them through their troubles. And then the final thing we're going to talk about is God's plan to handle anxiety within our lives. Well, how bad is this problem of anxiety and depression? In a survey done in June 2020, and this had to do with the the pandemic, it was discovered that almost 75% of all respondents struggled with anxiety of one form or another. Attempted suicide rate among teens went up by 40%. Our superintendent of schools just so happened to come by one day. A friend of mine was retiring, and I was about to take him to lunch. And he worked for the school system. And here came our superintendent. And we were talking and all. And and I told him, I said, I am so glad you only closed our schools from the middle of March until May to finish out that year. But you opened up the next year and said kids could either do it virtually or they could do it in person. And he caught a lot of flack in the news and in other places for doing that. But he said, you know, I, I wondered about that and if I did the wrong thing until a young lady came up to me on the first day of school and she said, I was ready to commit suicide. I was in the process. I was about to sit down and write my note because being away from everyone caused me to be too much inside my own head and I became so depressed I was ready to die. And then my mom squealed in the living room and said, guess what? More schools are going to be open. And she said, I'm going to be back with my friends I'm going to be back with my teachers, my counselors, with people I love. And she said, I tore up the note. Never even told my mom and dad what was going on. Teen suicide because of isolation and the problems that have come with that. The CDC reported that between April and August of 2021, four times as many people suffered from anxiety. The answer to this question of how bad this is is at the top of the list of problems that we all face, and especially now. Christians are not immune from anxiety, but we have help 
that the world does not know about. And we need to share it with them so that they can get through the tough stuff as well as New Testament Christians. Well, what are some of the major causes? Well, first of all, this morning going to look at something that just took place over the last two years because it has changed to a great degree. And basically, there are five things that, or four things rather, that families have been facing, that individuals have been facing because of COVID-19. One is isolation from their peers, which we just talked about, about that young teenager. Secondly, fear of death because so many were dying from this disease. Thirdly, financial stress due to business closings. We had several of our members at Central lose their jobs during this time, and uh, they didn't hurt because we, we helped take care of them. We came to their aid, but it hurt internally because they thought, am I not valued? Am I not needed anymore? And that causes a different kind of anxiety. And then family stress of all kinds. Now, there were some very positive things. A lot of families reconnected because they had to stay home. Maybe they uh, had to do their job virtually or whatever it is, and their children were not in school for that three months or so, and they reconnected as a result of that. I heard several young families say, we have not been able to spend this much time together in years, and now we have. But then on the other side of that coin, they said, we've not been able to spend this much time together for years, and especially if you've got teenagers. And uh, so, you know, that's one of the, the problems that came up was family stress, marital stress, parenting stress, the financial stress on families. But throughout time, there have been things that Satan has hurled at us to cause us to be anxious because he's hoping we'll just shut down. We'll just shut down as Christians and no longer serve God. And so he has thrown these things at us. And we're going to start where we just ended, family. Family throughout history has been a struggle. As far as marriage is concerned, God told Hosea in Hosea 1 and verse 2, you go and take a wife of harlotry. And that was Gomer, and I don't really think that's how that's pr pronounced. I don't want a wife named Gomer. I'm glad my wife's name's Kathy. It may be Gomer or something like that. But uh, whatever her name was and however it was supposed to be pronounced, uh, I, she wasn't a harlot when he married her. God is showing Hosea something about what he's going to need to preach because this is the exact same position as Israel. They had become unfaithful to God. And so Hosea and Gomer have their first two children, but when they have their third one, the name means not mine. She had been sleeping with somebody else, unfaithful to him, and that broke Hosea's heart. He finally goes and buys her off the auction block after everybody else was done with her and brings her back home. And the curtain closes because this was the picture of Israel at that time. Unfaithful to God and it didn't appear that they were ever going to come back and many did not because they died in captivity and they died in battles when God carried them away into captivity. Hosea learned that marriage can be a very anxious thing. And then in Proverbs 21, 19, Solomon says, and I bet with 700 wives and 300 concubines, he's bound to have really known what he was talking about. And that is, he says, it is better to live in a desert land than with a quarrelsome and fretful woman. And did you know fretful means anxiety to a great degree? And so we see that marriages underwent great trial throughout history. And then there's parenting. David had four sons, all of whom died. The baby that Bathsheba had, and then his sons who rebelled against him, and then the one who took his stepsister and was killed by his stepbrother. He had said when Nathan told him the story about the man who had the beautiful little ewe lamb, treated it like a baby, like his own child, and then the rich man next door stole that sheep, slaughtered it, and fed it to his company. David, what do you think? 
I think he ought to repay that four times. What did God do? Your baby's going to die. Two of your sons are going to rebel. And one of your sons is going to kill one of your other sons. Four times. Can you imagine the anxiety David had as a parent? And especially as those children got older. Choices children make cause great anxiety. When our daughter left home to go to school, I told Kathy, it's like watching her take her first steps. Now she's on her own. She's got to make some decisions on her own. And you're just so nervous about that. Can she do it? Can he do it? Are they going to make it? Are they going to fail? Anxiety over that. Financial. What about the loss of a job, as many have experienced? The cost of major health care. Matthew 5 and verse 25 concerning the woman with the issue of blood. The Bible says that she had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. That happens to us sometimes as well. Not being able to retire perhaps when you expected to retire and, you know, it was, it was true for a long time in this country, and I believe it's kind of changed. I haven't really heard uh, anybody say that this has happened to them. But right when you were about to be vested in retirement, they'd fire you. So they didn't have to pay it. And so that kind of thing happens as well. Bad investments, poor stewardship... All of these things cause terrible financial pain. And what about world affairs? Legitimizing sin as our country seems to be doing, doing at light speed right now. Legalizing drugs, abortion, which has been legal since 73, homosexuality and pushing homosexuality. How long is it going to be before uh, the White House says that if a homosexual wants to come and be your preacher... You have to accept them. What will we do? Well, we'll fight and we'll say no. We may have to go underground like the church did in Rome. Whatever the case is, it can't happen. Same-sex marriage, pan or transgender concepts, I don't even understand those terms, but legitimizing sin. And what about wars and tyranny? And we're seeing a, a terrible example of that right now in Ukraine. Why does Putin need Ukraine? He doesn't. He just wants to pull the old USSR all back together and be a world threat again. And it hurts us. My son went to Iraq the first time in 2003. He had just graduated from high school about four months before he had to go to Iraq. On Christmas Day, two years later in 2005... His wife was over at our house and, and we were having lunch together and the phone rings. And actually, the computer rang. And so we went and it was Corey and he was talking to us. And he talked to Shana for a while, his wife, and then to his mom and, and to his siblings. And, and it was a wonderful thing. But then I got back on there again and, and as he was talking, I kept hearing this little sound in the background. I said, Corey, what is that? Oh, Dad, he said the Iraqis are shooting uh, missiles at us, and he said they couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. <laughs> well, I'm glad they couldn't hit the broad side of a barn, but I really didn't want him to tell me that's what was happening to him at that time. And you talk about anxiety after you get off the phone when that kind of thing is going on, and now he's a cop. That's so much better. And uh, so, you know, we, we struggle with world affairs. And what about medical problems? Chemical imbalances in the brain that cause depression and anxiety sometimes and may not be diagnosed for a long time or may be misdiagnosed. And then chronic disease. January 6th of last year, my doctor called me. He's a member of the church and we talk about music because we love to sing, and he's a great song leader, and I can sing. But anyway, uh, he called me, and I had had a CAT scan the day before. I had a little problem going on. 
And he said, Tommy, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but you've got cancer. And I said, what? And he said, well, we know that where this is located, it can't be anything else. And he was right. And I've gone through four surgeries. One of those was an emergency surgery for, for uh, uh, hemorrhaging uh, very badly after one of those surgeries. But it's not gone, and they're going to have to do some radical things to make sure it never comes back. First of all, you don't believe it. You think, ah, they made a mistake. That's that denial. You go through almost all the stages of grief. Then you get angry, and I'm so glad that Brother Bill talked about what he talked about this morning. Because David sometimes expressed anger to God. Why are you doing this? Why have you not come and saved us? Why did you allow me to have cancer? We do that when that happens, and we're anxious because of that. But God is there, and God helps. And even if you get a diagnosis that's terminal, as a Christian, we're not standing alone. He'll be right there with us. And sometimes we're anxious about spiritual matters, feeling I've not done enough. Older Christians are, are just wrapped up in this. Have I done enough? On the day of, of judgment, is God going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity? I knew you not because I didn't do enough. Well, it's not about us. It's about Him. And it's about what He did for us on the cross. And it's about His forgiveness and His grace. And that we can hang on to that. Yes, we must live a faithful life out of gratitude for what God has done for us. But sometimes we are anxious about our spiritual life. And sometimes... For good reason, continuous bad habits, sinful habits, unfaithfulness in worship, in attendance. How many are not going to come back from the pandemic? Experts in the church are saying 20%. Brothers and sisters, there are over 2 million Christians in the United States. So 400,000 aren't coming back. It should not be that way. We ought to be stronger than that, but our anxiety tells us it's never going to be safe again. Some have said, COVID 19's here forever. Well, they don't know that. And secondly, when the flu killed millions of people back in the early 1900s and then later on in 1918 to 1920, yeah, the flu's still here. But guess what happened? God designed us in such a way to where the body develops immunity. And we need to grow up when it comes to that and get stronger and become more faithful. And if our elders call you up and say, listen, you need to come home. It's time to be in worship with us and not using live stream to sit around in your pajamas drinking coffee. We need to be there because we have been called to assemble together, Hebrews 10 and verse 25, and then putting worldly things above godly things. Well, very quickly, because we're out of time, I want us to think this morning for a few minutes about the fact that we are not alone. What about Hannah? Good woman, couldn't have a baby. In that day and time, if you were a Jew and you couldn't have a baby, you're sort of an outcast. And she prayed fervently, and in 1 Samuel 1, 16 and 17... She says, do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. We're in good company with good people who suffered with anxiety. What about Elijah? Anxiety caused him to feel isolated and alone when he had just won one of the greatest victories for God on Mount Carmel against the prophets of Baal. But then old Jezebel said, by tomorrow you're going to be like one of them. She was going to she put out a head on him, was going to have him killed. And so he says in 1 Kings 19, 10, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Don't we often feel like we're the only one trying to do it right? And we know that we're not. 
that God is with us, his family is with us. And what did he finally tell Elijah? There are 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Can you imagine how that encouraged him? And what about Jesus? He was troubled in his ministry. He said in John 12, verse 27, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. He knew the cross was coming. but He was human. He had prayed that it wouldn't, but he was ready to do whatever his father called him to do. Rich young ruler comes to Jesus. And the Bible says in Mark 10 and verse 21, Jesus looking at him loved him. I think when we think of the rich young ruler, we think of this smug, arrogant young man who walks up and he's wearing the greatest finery in the world. And Jesus says, go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And he walked away because he had much. There was something good in that young man, but worldliness kept it locked up. And in John 6, after Jesus preaches a, a very unusual sermon about eating his body and drinking his blood, he knew what he was talking about, but they hadn't really been listening. And so the Bible says they turn and walked with him no more. And so he turns around to his disciples in, verse, in verses 66 through 68, and he says to them, will you go away also? There's that human side. He's hurt. They've left him. But Peter says the greatest thing I believe that man ever said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus also struggled in the garden. In Mark 14, and he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed. That word means to be thrown into amazement or terror, to be alarmed or terrified. And he was troubled. That means to be in distress of mind and uncomfortable. Jesus suffered greatly. And the Bible says in Luke twenty two forty four 44, that being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And then there's Paul who lists all of those things that had happened to him in 2 Corinthians 11. And in verse 28 he says, And apart from these other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Was Paul sinful because of that? Now he really wasn't distracted, even though this is the exact same word. But instead of worrying about himself, he just kept looking at the churches and he was concerned. He had great care for them. In the great song, he knows just what I need. The last verse says, when other friends seem to forget me, when skies are dark, when hope is gone, by faith I feel his arms about me and hear him say, you're not alone. Finally this morning, what is God's plan for me to survive anxiety? There are attitudes and actions that need to be taken. Don't be too embarrassed to share your anxiety with brothers and sisters in Christ. Secondly, seek professional help if you need it. But thirdly, trust in the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths, casting all of your anxiety of, upon Him because He cares for you. And that's 1 Peter 5 and verse 7. Trust God. My wife just so happened to have bought a little thing she's going to put up in our house and it says this. I trust the next chapter because I know the author. We need to trust in God. And then there are actions that we need to take because of this. One, pray fervently. Be anxious in nothing but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving in your heart, make your request known to God. David said in Psalm 42, 11, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. It is a prayer. That's what he's praying. And we need to be praying fervently as well. Develop a thankful heart. Again, Philippians 4, 6, our text. Ephesians 5, 20, give thanks always. Colossians 3, 17, giving thanks to God the Father through Him, speaking of Jesus. 
Seek out Christian counseling if you need to. A secular counselor may lead you in the wrong direction. In fact, may say to you, it's because of your religious ideas that you have all this anxiety. Folks, if we have the truth in us, that will never be the cause of anxiety. And so we need to make sure that we are seeking good counsel. Take what is prescribed. If you go to a doctor and he says you need to take this, you need to take it. But let's take God's prescription as well. And let's make sure that, first of all, we're not anxious because we're praying, because we have a thankful heart. Limit your obligations. Young people, don't get into 20 things at once. My mama used to say they're, they're catching themselves coming back because they're just too busy. We can become so busy we can't do what God wants us to do. Avoid isolation. This may cause you to overthink your problem. Get more rest. That's one of the things God did with Elijah. When he was ha- headed to Mount Horeb, God caused him to fall asleep. When he woke up, here was a hot uh, cake that had been baked for him and a, a jar of water. And God did that with him twice. God knew Elijah was exhausted. And this was part of his problem and why he didn't think God was taking care of him anymore. And then he went to Mount Horeb. We need to find our mountain as well. So eat well like he did. Get rest. Find your place of inspiration. Elijah went to Mount Horeb, Jesus to the Mount of Olives. Where's our mountain? Let's find it and let's go there. Rediscover joy. That's the first thing he said in that text. Rejoice in the Lord always. Find joy again. Proverbs 17, 22, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. And then seek out good companions. Let your reasonableness be known to all. The Lord is at hand. David had Jonathan. Elijah had Elisha. Jesus had Lazarus, Mary, Martha, Peter, James, and John. Paul had an entourage that followed him. that he felt to be the father of those young men especially that went with him. God does not expect us to go it alone with both human companionship and his divine companionship. And then finally, cast it all upon the Lord. God commands us not to be anxious about anything. And in order for the peace of God to surpass understanding in our lives, we must trust in that, for he will lead us through the valley of the shadow of death. The Lord said to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for wholeness and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. Hebrews 6, 19, that's the anchor of our soul, even our hope. Through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let's let all of our requests be known to God through Jesus. Share your yoke with God because he can carry us through and carry our burdens. That way we can say confidently, the Lord is good today and forever. May all of us find the victory that we need over anxiety and depression through our Lord. God bless you.